he, he introduced me as a director of instructional labs. That's my formal title. As I tell people, my informal title is I'm the head lab rat. So I try to teach people how to build things. Speaking of building things, uh, you know, I've been doing that for a long time. And in fact, in some respects, I, uh, that's one of the joys of, of engineering that, that I've had. Um, I've done a lot of stuff with circuit design and, and, and that kind of stuff. And so what I want to talk about, I want to talk about uh, what's called Earth-Moon-Earth -Earth Communications, or EME. Um, and <clears throat> what is it? Well, it's using the moon as, uh, as a reflector, as a passive reflector. And it, um, it has an interesting footnote in the history of satellite communications. And it's become a challenge within the amateur radio community. Are any of you ham radio operators? Any of you got ham license? Yeah, there's a couple. Uh, that's how I got into this business a lot of years ago. And so what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about what it, a little bit of that history, uh, how I got into it here at Tech. I want to talk about some of the technical issues. Uh, you know, from the communication standpoint, I brought some of my hardware. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a thing called JT65, which is a you know a unique and a very specifically designed DSP algorithm for for EME for working at ultra low no signal to noise ratios. Uh, and then we'll take a little bit of a look at the hardware and, and some, some of the challenges ahead. Uh, as I say, it, it uses the moon as a passive reflector. You go out 400,000 kilometers, you bounce off the moon, you come back 400,000 kilometers. There's about a two and a half second delay. And the, needless to say, after you've made that trip, you don't get much of your signal back. It's ultra weak. And it was, you know, uh, let me, let me, I'll talk about the Navy here in a bit. But as I say, it's been, you know, the Navy used it uh, in the days before satellites to communicate with ships. And, of course, communication satellites made all that obsolete. <clears throat> but it got taken up by the amateur radio community as a challenge. And it's been successfully done on every amateur band from 10 meters, that is 30, 30 megahertz, up through 47 48 gigahertz. There's currently an attempt to do it at 78 gigahertz. Uh, <clears throat> and it has been described a little bit like the amateur radio equivalent of climbing Mount Everest. It is a technical challenge. Um, now, let's see if I can get the, the, uh, the example to work here. How do I get that? Uh, I just um, minimize the uh, the window and it should be right there on your desktop. Ah, yeah. Okay. Now, this is a <clears throat> this was done by a gentleman in Australia. It was done at 2.3 gigahertz, and what he what you're going to hear is you're going to hear him transmit the first three letters of his call letters in Morse code. It's going to be V K three. The V is da 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 da. The K is da da da, and the three is da 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 da. Now, you will hear that very clearly, but you will also hear the echo. say it's pretty weak, isn't it? Now that you know what you're listening for. Okay. So there's an example. Needless to say, it's pretty weak. Uh, 
as I said, historically, this was first done at, right after World War II. The uh, U.S. Uh, Army Corps, Signal Corps, did it at, in, at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, and they used some equipment that they had uh, scrounged that was you know, old radar equipment. It was done at 111 and a half megahertz. Uh, they ran about 3,000 watts to the transmitter, and they managed to get their echoes. Um, this is actually an important experiment because prior to this time, no one really knew whether a signal would go out into space and could come back. I mean, they really didn't know. I mean, UHF, VHF communications was a very new and unexplored area. So this was really an, ex an important experiment because what it said is, is that you could go out into space and come back. Uh, it was used in the 1950s. The U.S. Naval Research Lab did it. They had an operational system that they started in January of 1960. They went between Washington and Hawaii, and they used it for um, se secure communications before the days of communications satellites. There's also another interesting footnote. Uh, up in Sugar Grove, West Virginia, which is not all that far from here, is a few thousand tons of steel in that they that uh, some government agency was going to build a 600 foot diameter fully movable reflector and what they wanted to do with it is they wanted to listen to Russian two-way radio communication that leaked out into space and bounced off the moon if any of you've ever read the puzzle palace there's a story in there about that the other thing that's kind of interesting is Project Echo. This is the first passive communication satellite. It was launched in the summer of 1960. And I remember it, I went out, you know, I was about yay so big in 1960. Uh, <clears throat> and I went out to Kansas City, Missouri to visit my uncle, and it was front page news for a week. We went out and, and watched the thing go over in a little tiny dot of light. But they tested the system that they used with Echo by doing moon bounce. The antenna, by the way, that, that AT&T used, uh, Bell Labs used, is in Homedale, New Jersey. It's also the antenna that Penzias and Wilson used to discover the three Kelvin background radiation. And it, it found its way into amateur circles. Uh, and they, people started working on this pretty early on. In, in 1953, a couple of gentlemen received, heard, heard their own echoes at 144 megahertz, but they did not communicate. Uh, they were unable to, to exchange uh, a communication. The first official EME communication, or as hams call it, a QSO, was done by the IMAC Radio Club out in California. And this was done at 1296 megahertz, and the picture there is the, is the team that did it. Uh, notice the dish they covered with aluminum foil. Um, it was done at 144 megahertz finally in 1964, at 432 megahertz also in 1964. The, the one end of that link was the, the radio telescope at Arecibo. Um, and you can see there... Uh, people have done it at you know, 220 megahertz, 2.3 gigahertz, 50 megahertz. These are all amateur bands. It was done at 24 gigahertz, which is one and a quarter centimeters. It was done at uh, 2005 at 47 gigahertz. There's currently a team trying to do it at 78. Uh, what do you need to do it? Well, it takes large antennas high transmitter powers, and ultra-low noise receivers. And attention to detail means you've got to get everything right. Every tenth of a dB makes a difference. Uh, and you know, there's a, a reference there to an article in the, the amateur radio magazine QST that Paul Wade did. Uh, it's kind of an interesting read. It's October 2013 of QST. Uh, there are hundreds of stations in the world that can do it at 144, 432, and 1296 megahertz. Um, 
However, <clears throat> as you go higher in frequency, when you move into the microwave region, there are fewer and fewer people to do it because it's a very challenging, particularly to generate the transmitter power. And I estimate there's about 50 stations in the world that are capable of doing it at 10 gigahertz. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the web. The little clip that I played you was from VK3NX's website. Uh, he's, he's a gentleman in, in Australia who's big into this. Uh, the second reference there is uh, the paper on that website has is, is got some good, very detailed technical information. And then W5LUA uh, uh, is, is a fellow down in Texas who's been involved in this. In fact, he was the one who did the first 24 gigahertz at uni. And if you Google these folks, you get lots and lots of information. How did I get into it? Well, you know, as I said, I'm the, I'm the DIL, and, and one of my objectives is to try to find interesting things for students to do. Um, and, you know, I started doing these high-altitude balloon missions that the students really kind of like. We're working on one right now. <coughs> but I thought, you know, I want to find something that's electrical engineering. And I came up with the idea of doing moon bounce. And so I, kind of my first attempt here, um, there was a three-meter dish out at the old satellite tracking station. There's, the, there's kind of a picture of it up there. Uh, and I got parts. I've got a 100-watt power amplifier, and I've got a super low-noise receiver amplifier. And the lower left picture there is the bits that I put together for the, the essentially what people do to operate in the microwave region is they take 28 megahertz from a commercial uh, uh, high frequency radio transceiver and convert it up. Uh, and that's what this is. It, they're often referred to as transverters. There's a receiving down converter and a transmitting up converter that are part of the, the unit. However, <clears throat> I found this. This is a five and a half meter antenna. It was a KU band satellite uplink terminal. If you, you if you go out the 460 and you see the antennas in the field, well, this is one of them. It turned out that these were no longer usable, um, and it sat unused for well over 10 years. So we, we talked the university. One of my colleagues talked the university out of it. So we've been, been playing with it. So I decided to, to, to attempt doing EME, not ECE, uh, EME at 10 gigahertz rather than at 2.3. Well, I had to build it. First part of it was a highly stable, low phase noise local oscillator. I'll talk about that in a little bit in a minute. Um, the junk box, I got a basement full of stuff. My wife tells me our house will never blow away because the basement's full of radio junk. Uh, produced many of the waveguide bits. Um, the high power transmitter was a traveling wave tube. I bought it for about $300 off of eBay. <clears throat> the low noise amplifier also came off of eBay. It was about 30 bucks. Uh, and it was a low noise block down converter for the European television band. It was designed for 11 gigahertz. Well, you know, I'll show you in a minute what I did, <clears throat> but I took it apart and modified it, and now it makes a very nice low noise amplifier for 10.4 gigahertz. All right, let's, let's talk a little bit, get into some of the meat of this here. Uh, the question is, how much transmitter power do you need, and how good a receiver do you have to have? So I started with a thing called the radar equation. Radar equation is a little bit like, I'm sure all of you know about path loss. Uh, well, this is kind of a variant of that path loss calculation that gives you the received signal power when a, uh, a radio when radio signal bounces off of something. And a couple of things that are important: the received power is a function of one over the distance, one over r to the fourth, not one over r squared. 
So the other thing that's important is that sigma. That's the that's what's called the radar cross section, or the you know when you bounce the signal off something, how how big does it really appear? You, I'm sure you've heard of stealth technology. You know the military wants their airplanes to disappear on radar, so what they do is they make sigma as small as they can. Well, it turns out that sigma is not very big for the moon. The effective area of the reflecting area of the moon is only six or seven percent of its physical area. So you can take all the numbers, and calculate what the path loss is, and at 10,368 megahertz, which is what the frequency a lot of people use, the path loss is 289.2 dB. Now, path loss from the Earth to geostationary orbit at KU band, which is 14 gigahertz, is about 220 dB. Now you remember, dB is a logarithmic measure. So you're not going to get very much of it back. Okay, so let's do a little blink power budget. I started out with a transmitter power of, yeah, question. That's one question. Here it looks like we have a Three aspects per position. Then why the loss is r to the power of four in r? Okay, because you're going out. One over r squared. You come back. One over r squared. You multiply the two of them together. You get one over r to the fourth. That's the short answer. You know, you get. I can I can give you good reference. A skull neck is the is the classic radar systems book, but that's the problem with radar. Uh, because of the, the you got to you got to go you got to cover the path twice. That's the one over R to the fourth. Okay, uh, I started out with a transmitter power of thirty, roughly thirty watts, fifteen dBW. Uh, my five point five meter antenna uh, should have a gain of about fifty three dB. I got a loss of two hundred and eighty nine point two dB. I come back to my receiving antenna, I got another 53 dB, and after I add it all up, the received power is minus 168.2 dBW. Okay, that's the received power. The noise power in the system, you know, good old KTB, uh, the system temperature is about 300 kelvins, uh, system bandwidth is about 1000 hertz, and I'll, I'll make some comments about why I chose those in a moment. So you can calculate what the noise power is. It turns out the noise power is minus 173.7 dBW. The, the echoes you would hear are only 5.5 dB out of the noise. And they'd sound a lot like what you just heard. You could hear them. You know, actually hear the echoes, and that's... Uh, that's actually a pretty strong signal. If you can hear your own echoes, that's pretty good. Um, now, what can I do to make it better? And that bigger, it turns out a bigger antenna doesn't help. You say, well, more antenna. Anybody know why a bigger antenna wouldn't work? Anybody hazard a guess? You've already resolved the moon. Yeah, you're on the right track. Your beam's smaller. That's right. That five and a half meter dish is about a half a degree beam width. The moon is about a half a degree extent. If I make a bigger antenna, I essentially illuminate less of the moon. Now, of course, it reflects off, but I don't buy, it doesn't buy me anything. Uh, okay, so I can't make a bigger antenna. How about making a lower noise receiver? Well, it turns out that the moon is about 200 kelvins. And so as a result, when I point my antenna at the moon, because the moon fills the antenna beam, the antenna temperature is about 200 kelvins. So if I had a perfect LNA, my noise system noise temperature would be 200 kelvins. Right now I got an LNA that's about, about 100 kelvins, and maybe there's a little bit more loss, so I've said 310 kelvins for my system noise temperature. 
How about more transmitter power? That actually that works. Uh, I got a 30 watt tube. Uh, you know, I can get to the 100 watt power level, but finding a tube is pretty, pretty rare and pretty expensive. Uh, there's actually a pair of 250 watt tubes in the, in that old uplink station. The problem is there's an 11,000 volt power supply that powers them. They haven't been turned on in 15 years, and I don't have the nerve to do it. Uh, the other thing is, is they were designed for 14 gigahertz, <clears throat> and I have my doubts whether they'd work at 10.4. 30 to 50 watts is about a reasonable limit. So that's what, you know, uh, we've kind of done the best we can. Uh, the other problem you run into is that the moon's orbit is not exactly circular. So you get a variation in distance. The distance varies from about... Oh, 30, roughly uh, 360,000 kilometers to about 400,000 kilometers. So there's a 2 dB difference in path loss over the, over the course of the moon's orbit. So, you know, obviously you'd like to pick that point when it's closest to the Earth, but you can't always do that. Um, there's a whole bunch of things you got to deal with. <clears throat> Uh, let's you know the propagation is one of them. You know you think oh this is this is free space propagation. Well it is, but it turns out that at lower frequencies, uh, particularly below 2.3 gigahertz, there's a thing called Faraday rotation that you go through the ionosphere and the polarization is shifted. <clears throat> when you come back, the polarization has shifted some more, so you may be transmitting horizontal polarization and you'll get you won't get horizontal back. There's a Doppler shift because the moon is moving both in its orbit and on its axis. Uh, there's a thing called libration fading, and that's a signal spreading due to the fact that the moon is not a specular reflector. And that's the reason why I'm stuck with that 1,000 hertz system bandwidth. Um, you know, I've got problems with polarization. Now, most of the amateur radio community below 5.6 gigahertz is using circular polarization, and on a minute I'll show you why. <clears throat> There's the pointing and tracking problem. I've got a 5.5 meter dish, and its beam width is only a half a degree, so I've got to point this thing within a tenth of a degree or so. Uh, the transmitter, you never have enough power, and a few tenths of a dB uh, is loss is easy to come by and it bites. Uh, receiving, the same problem. You know, any loss between the antenna and your low noise amplifier is really a killer. Uh, and there's also a problem where you've got to do the changeover correctly. Because you need to turn the receiver off, operate the antenna switch, and then turn the receiver transmitter on. You have to sequence it. Transmitter does not like to operate into, uh, it needs to operate into a well-matched load. Tube gets very unhappy when it isn't. Um, and then there's some operate, you know, the, you, I'll talk a little bit about testing the sun and moon noise. Uh, and then there's modulation. Uh, the classic modulation has been Morse code, CW. But in recent years, there's been the development of this very powerful signal processing technique called WSJT, Weak Signal Joe Taylor, and I'll talk about Joe Taylor in a moment, and there's a thing called JT65. And then you kind of have, there's, this, there's the coordination thing. You've got to find somebody to talk to, and these people are all over the world. Okay, here's the polarization problem. Um, if I transmit, say if here in Blacksburg I transmit horizontal polarization, 90 degrees around the globe it's going to appear to the receiving station as vertical polarization. And in fact, we're going to start out at 10 gigahertz. I'm going to do horizontal. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of amateurs, particularly below 5.6 gigahertz, uh, are running circular. And circular chain... Uh, mitigates this problem. Um, 
but it's real easy for me to generate the, the horizontal polarization. So I'm going to get on the air, and then when I get it to work, I can add the circular. Uh, the other problem is, is that there's a, a change with time. Um, and if you look at the loss, there's a loss associated with being cross-polarized. Uh, if you're 45 degrees cross-polarized, you, you'll get a, a, a 3 dB loss. Well, all of a sudden, I'm not 290 dB anymore. I'm 293 dB, and, and I get and that bites. Um, there's a thing called libration fading. The moon, in its orbit, is not smoothly continuous. It tends to wobble or rock slightly, so the distance changes. Uh, the, as I said, the reflections are not specular. Uh, the moon's surface is not smooth, particularly at three centimeters. It's pretty rough at three centimeters. So you can, you can see uh, the effect of constructive, destructive interference and you can get fades up to 20 dB. Um, at shorter wavelengths, what ha like at 10 gigahertz, what it begins to sound like is it begins to sound very rough, and the signal returned to you is not terribly coherent. Um, and that's the reason why I can't narrow the bandwidth to do better signal-to-noise ratio, because the libration fading tends to spread the signal. Um, and it turns out that libration fading is predictable, so uh, it varies over the moon's period, and there are times when it's a min and a max and what have you, but it is predictable, thankfully. Here's an example. Uh, the plot on, on the right, uh, this was done at, at 1296 megahertz. Uh, and you can see these lar relatively large changes. Let me talk about WSJT for a minute. Um, this is a fairly new addition. It's a digital signal processing routine written by a guy named Joe Taylor. K1JT is his ham call letter. Taylor won the Nobel Prize in physics in 1993, so this guy's no slouch. And he's been very, very supportive of the amateur radio community because he said that's how he got into, into physics, and he wanted to give back. Um, he won the Nobel Prize in 93 for the discovery of a particular type of pulsar, and uh, that he showed indirectly that there was a, the only way that he could uh, account for the loss in the pulse rate was by energy loss to gravitational waves. So uh, uh, I once went to a dinner where he was the after-dinner speaker, and he, and he passed the Nobel medal around. And that's the closest I've ever come to a Nobel. Uh, the, the thing with, with WSJT is... It allows you to communicate with, with stations that's, that are too weak to hear. It's extremely, it works extremely well for low signal-to-noise ratio applications. And you think about digital signal processing. You remember the DSP is usually tailored very much for a particular modulation format to maximize its performance. And JT65 is no, uh, no different. What it does is it encodes two amateur radio call signs, my call sign and the guy I'm trying to talk to, a thing called the Maidenhead Grid Locator. That's a, the, the earth is divided up into one, these one by two degree segments uh, that indicate where you are on the globe. You know, we are in FM 97, for example, uh, and a signal report, and that's compressed into 71 bits. Uh, if you were transmitting that information 
via on-off keying, which is what Morse code is, there would be 170 bits in that message. So there's some there's some signal there's some data compression here. There's also a bit flag. It goes to a Reed Solomon uh, encoder, which turns that 72-bit data message into 63 six-bit channel symbols. Okay, and the result is is the the coding distance is essentially 53 bits. So there's a reason there's a very you know, the coding space is very very large. And that's the reason why it works at super low signal to noise ratios. Uh, the symbols are then interleaved and converted to gray code. This makes JT65 somewhat more tolerant to frequency instabilities. Um, and then it then it's transmitted. Uh, and a transmit sequence takes about 48 seconds. So there's only 71 bits of information. It takes you 48 seconds. Uh, this is not intended for high-speed internet. But it's exactly what you need for this kind of communication. Um, there's a pseudo-random sync vector in this thing that's interspersed with the data bits and that allows it to be self-synchronizing. Uh, the sync tone runs at 1270 and a half hertz. Um, each transmission is then divided into 126 contiguous time intervals that last 372 milliseconds. Um, and each one of those intervals has got a FSK waveform using 65 different predetermined tones. Uh, so the occupied bandwidth is actually only about 355 hertz. The, the, uh, the uh, frequency shift is 5.4 hertz. And you can detect JT65 at about 24 dB below the noise level. Um, and what this has done is it allowed a lot of... Uh, stations with small antennas and relatively modest transmitter power to get into the fun of boom bounce. So one of the things I got to work on is getting this to work. There's, there's software available. You download it, install it, runs on your computer, works with your sound card. Because <coughs> uh, a lot of people are using it. Uh, the other thing I've got to do is I've got to, we've got to figure out about moon tracking. There's some software that does this. F1EHN uh, is, is a French amateur who, who wrote this program uh, that does the moon tracking, and it predicts the Doppler shift. If you'll notice down there in the right, lower right-hand corner, he's running at uh, 10 gigahertz, and the Doppler shift is minus 21 kilohertz, roughly. So if I'm running in a one kilohertz bandwidth, I got to know that. Uh, so let me talk a little bit. Does anybody have any questions before? You know, I think I got a couple more minutes here. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the hardware. I brought the hardware along with me. Um, and uh, this is a picture of the local oscillator and the RX, the receiver transmitter converter. Um, I can't, I got the, the local oscillator is across the top. And I have an input. All right. At 63 megahertz, it comes from this little thing. Remember I said that you know, one of the things that I had to do with JT65 is I had to be very frequency stable over the transmission. So as a result, I've got this. This is a, it's a 63 megahertz oscillator phase locked to a 10 megahertz uh, ovenized crystal reference. The crystal reference, uh, it sat on my bench for about a week and it drifted less than 100 hertz at 10 gigahertz. Uh, this is a uh, an eight hundred to a thousand dollar oscillator. 
Uh, I paid about 25 bucks for it on eBay. eBay is a great place to go, but you got to know what you're doing. Uh, <clears throat> the the little box there in the upper upper left is the first multiplier. The 63 megahertz goes in. It's multiplied by eight. 504 megahertz comes out. Uh, the little box in the middle is a times five. The output of that is 2520 megahertz. Um, you see the little gold cable across the top? Well, if you look closely at the left end, there's a little block. And that little block is a mini circuits diode harmonic generator. It generates the fourth harmonic. It goes over to, there's a wa three section waveguide filter there, and that little gray box is an amplifier. So out of this comes 10 milliwatts of 10,080 megahertz energy. The little orange box on the far right contains a diode ring mixer. It's a passive mixer uh, that takes the 10,080 megahertz, multiplies it by a 288 megahertz signal coming in, and it produces the sum and the difference. The sum is 10,368. Down along the right-hand side there, you will see that's a five-section waveguide bandpass filter that selects out the sum frequency. <clears throat> At the very bottom, there's a circulator. Now, this may be a new gizmo to some of you. It's a non-reciprocal device that power flows only in one direction around it. So power flows out of the mixer, through the circulator, into the, that silver box in the bottom, which is, uh, which is the transmit amplifier. I get about 10 milliwatts out of that. On receive, right there in the center, there's a little gray box. Uh, that's the low noise amplifier. <clears throat> I couldn't find a piece of waveguide that goes with it. A, the the waveguide switch is right there in the center on that little aluminum gizmo. Uh, the LNA <coughs> started out life as a low noise block converter for the European TV band, and I took it apart and I milled a slot in the in the uh, casting and soldered a connector in there. Uh, I removed some of the the microstrip stuff, soldered a connector in there and got the output of the amplifier. And it's a very nice amplifier. It's less than 1 dB noise figure at 10 gigahertz and it's got about 26 dB of gain. It's a nice amplifier. Uh, power flows out of that into the circulator, goes around the other direction, uh, goes through the filter back into the mixer. The mixer is passive. It works in both directions. So I use it as an up converter and I use it as a down converter. This is the transmitter. The heat sink is for the traveling wave tube. The, the little box with a meter in it is the terminators for the power supply. The TWT requires about 4,000 volts. So I've got a power supply, and I connect the 4,000 volt power supply to the tube through coaxial cables. You can't see it very well, but inside the plastic box, there are a number of special high high voltage coaxial connectors, coaxial connectors designed to operate at 5,000 volts. Uh, and there's also a little switch there that you take the lid off the box, shuts the power supply off. And needless to say, you don't want to get cooked. Uh, there's the tube, the red, that red gizmo is the tube. At the left end, uh, there's a those little aluminum bars connect, conduct the heat away. Uh, I get about 50 watts out of the tube. Um, traveling wave tubes are kind of an interesting beastie. Uh, they're somewhat of an art, lost art. Although if you're in the satellite business, they still use traveling wave tubes and satellites. Uh, and if you, if you monkey with the voltages on the tube correctly, you can actually make the tube operate much better over a narrow bandwidth, and that's what I've done. I'm getting about 50 watts out of the tube. Uh, I'm going to play with it some more. I've been told that I might be able to get as much as 100. Now, 100 watt, 50 watts at 10 gigahertz is a lot of power. 
And you can't just take a piece of cable and, and transmit that power. I mean, I've, I've used some little pieces of 141-inch, um, that semi-rigid uh, coaxial cable. It gets hot. I mean, a piece that long gets very hot. Um, here's the noise performance <coughs> of my oscillator. This is, this is multiplied up to, this is uh, the output frequency of 10,080 uh, megahertz. Uh, the first, first line there uh, to the right is, is one kilohertz offset from the carrier, and I'm down I'm down almost, I'm down 100, roughly 100 dB with respect to the carrier at 1 kilohertz away. So this is, a, this is actually a pretty good oscillator at, at 10 gigahertz. And uh, although I think I can do better, uh, I'm going to do some more work on this. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's very stable and it's very low noise. Okay, kind of, what do I have left to do? Well, I gotta I gotta add another waveguide switch. You know, up there, right up in the in top center, that little block in the top center is the waveguide switch. It can the antenna connection comes out the hole in the bottom. The transmitter is on the left hand side, and the receiver is on the right. The problem is, uh, and and I didn't think about this when I built it. Here's a good example of a system consideration that comes back to bite you. The traveling wave tube has got an electron gun in it. It works on a beam of electrons. And the tube does not like running the electron gun hot, the emitter's hot in the electron gun, if the beam voltage is turned off. Okay, you want the beam formed in the tube all the time. If you turn off the beam voltage, the electron cloud that, that surrounds the cathode, that surrounds the emitter, eventually damages the emitter. Okay, so you leave the beam, beam voltage on. And you switch the tube to a load during receiving. Fine, that's what I've done. Actually, I've, I've got an isolator device that to make sure the tube always sees a load. But the problem is traveling wave tubes, because they're beam, electron beam devices, are very noisy. And I sat down and I calculated the noise power out of the tube when it's, when it's not transmitting. And then measured the isolation on the waveguide switch and the noise power that leaks across the waveguide switch is about 20 dB above the noise floor in the receiver. So I'm not going to hear anything because the noise in the, in, from the tube leaking across the switch is going to, going to desensitize the receiver. So I've got to add over there on the left hand side, you know, you see that, you know, the bend with a piece of waveguide. I got to put another switch in there so that I get another 60 dB of isolation so I don't get the noise from the tube into the, uh, but I mean, these are the kind of things that when you're when you're running right on the edge, you got to think about. Um, I need to modify the the dish controller. It was originally designed, you know, it has some motors that run the axes. Well, only one motor would run at a time, and I and they're pretty slow. And I got to run both both motors at the same time in order to track them. So uh, I got to modify the controller to do that. And it took a special transformer. I guess where I found this special transformer? eBay, right? eBay. You got it. Uh, exactly the right transformer. Uh, I've got some high accuracy position sensors. They're tenth, de tenth of a degree sensors. But I need to, I need to uh, mount those on the dish and calibrate them. Uh, calibration may be a challenge because the people who used the dish before screwed up the calibration on the pointing, so I don't know where it's pointing. You know, you got a half a degree beam width, and uh, so I actually I found a satellite with it. You know, after some some work, I actually found a satellite with the dish, and I know what satellite it is, and I've 
calculated what the look angles for that satellite are, so now I have a cal point. So I've got to go back and fix that. Um, and I need to integrate the sensors and the pointing controller with that, with that tracking software. And then mount the transverter on the dish. Uh, then there's testing. Okay, there are two ways to test the system. You've got to make sure that your receiver is working. And as I said, the moon is 200 kelvins or so. So what you do is you aim your dish and watch the moon drift through the beam and measure the change in the noise floor. And that's actually not too difficult to do with a modern spectrum analyzer. How many of you know what a radiometer is? Does anybody know what a radiometer is? There are a few of you. Yeah, a few of you. Uh, essentially, you can make a radi radiometer is a power measuring instrument for noise. It measures noise power. And you can do that with a modern spectrum analyzer if, if you know how to set it up. So that's what I'm going to do. The no uh, you can also do a sun noise test. Uh, you know, sun, the sun is, <coughs> is a very powerful radio emitter. You can, you can uh, there's information uh, published about the effective temperature of the sun. So you let the sun transit through your beam and measure the change in the noise, noise floor. And, and in fact, if you went to BK3NX's website, he'll almost, you know, for every one of his systems, he'll give you know, a moon noise and a sun noise and so many dB. And that's, you know, dB above the noise floor. And then we go for the echoes. And once we hear the echoes, we go for the QSOs. We, go, we try to talk to people. 